I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Elaine Traharn. She is with us today from Stanford University, where she is the Roberta Bauman Denning Professor of Humanities. Humanities, and she is the author of a forthcoming book from Oxford University Press titled The Phenomenal Book, Perceptions of Medieval Manuscripts. So with no further ado, please take it away, Elaine. Okay, thank you ever so much, Erin. Thanks for all of the organization. And um, as I was saying to Erin earlier, uh, I've been on sabbatical all year, um, which is incredibly lucky, but um, uh, therefore, I'm quite rusty in terms of uh, putting together uh, some kind of presentation, and I hope that that doesn't uh, show too much. And this is going to be more of a sort of gallop through mise en page, uh, through page layout um, over the course of about um, just under a thousand years in the next sort of 35 minutes. And so um, there's not a great deal of room for interaction with you, my lovely audience, um, and thank you so much for being here. Um, but I uh, am happy to take questions and answers at the end. And at the bottom of your screens, there should be a Q&A button. It's a, like a little speech bubble. Um, if you have questions as I go, please do put them in the Q&A and then Erin uh, and I will uh, filter those uh, in a live session at the end of this talk. Um, talking of being on sabbatical and talking of privilege, I recognize how privileged I am. Um, a, to, to be able to do what I do, but particularly in times like this. And I really want to acknowledge um, the, uh, the virus and uh, the way that that's um, hurt so many people's lives and um, also brought about so many other um, kinds of problems. And uh, to be able to have the kind of respite of manuscript studies um, is wonderful, I think, and shows the importance of the humanities at a time um, like this. Um, so the other thing to say is that the majority, in fact, I think all of my examples today come from Western manuscripts, which is my own sort of specialization. You can narrow it further to, uh, in my case, British manuscripts. Um, there is an awful lot to be said about mise en page, page layout, the layout of the text in, in manuscript cultures around the world. And I hope that um, there'll be more on that uh, at some point in the future. And then just a further couple of things to say is that, um, you know, a lot of the work that was done on mise en page um, up until I suppose the sort of 1990s or even into the 2000s was done by scholars often working from plates in published volumes like E.A. Lowe's Codices Latini Antiquiores um, uh, or the New Paleographical Society plates. And if you and really when you think about what they were able to achieve these scholars through first of all analysing material in that format before getting a chance to see most but not necessarily all of the manuscripts they wanted to work on. It's quite extraordinary. But in a sense, if we can take an analogy, um, Lisa Fagan Davis, Ben Albritton and others who work on fragments and fragmentology to work on plates is akin to working with a fragment. So any of you who work on fragments, who so have libraries um, from sort of small um, town libraries to um, uh, kind of small university libraries, you will often have fragments in your collection and you can um, do the kind of work that I'm going to demonstrate in relation to mostly codices books um, with fragments. And because the thing that we're looking for really when we're talking about mise en page or the page layout um, are patterns. And uh, from that point of view too, there's a huge uh, potential for this kind of work in relation to um, machine learning. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. So what artificial intelligence could do for us in terms of determining patterns of mise en page or page layout. So uh, feel free to, to email me or put things in the Q&A. Okay, so this is a, not a manuscript, but it will be a manuscript when somebody writes on it and manuscript culture has never left us. And I think that's a really important point to make and will outlast any other form of text technology. I am fairly certain of that. But if you look at an ordinary composition book and you can do this with your students or just think about it yourself. I mean, if you take something like this and I said to you, okay, I want you to list 20 things about this, this object, this textual artifact, um, list 20 things about this. I do this with my own students and they kind of, they're really quite puzzled to begin with. And I say, no, just list 20 things about it. And so they will say it's, it's white and it's rectangular and so on. And they'll create this list and the list will almost inevitably, and, and kind of aut like an automaton, the list will inevitably be written in a linear fashion on the lines of the composition book, because lines regulate what we do. And this format, um, 
uh, this format with the, the red kind of marginal vertical line to the left and the, the horizontal lines across the um, page um, or the recto of the folio um, obviously uh, is descended not from printed books but in fact from uh, medieval manuscripts and text technologies being as they are kind of incremental um, and building on all of the things that come before them. The printed book itself, of course, is uh, very, very much based on the format that it inherited from medieval manuscripts in the 15th and 16th centuries in the West. So print was obviously much earlier um, in the East in China. Uh, so mechanical type. Uh, so, okay, so this composition book kind of gives us a hint to the type of thing that we're going to be talking about, um, the way that the page is laid out, and then mise en text would be the uh, next stage. Mise en text, we would think about um, the textual disposition on the page, so how the text is arranged on the page. And a really interesting question to ask of all of the material that you look at as a medievalist, as a manuscript scholar, is a lot of, a lot of interest comes from asking the question, um, what is the page encouraging us to do? Especially once that page has been uh, ruled or made into a pattern, what would it be encouraging its readers to do? So page layout is more than just the mechanics um, of the way uh, that you put the page design together and it can be taken a step further to ask that question sort of so what or why, why does this matter? So mise en page and mise en text, we're thinking about page layout, we're thinking about the framework or the foundation of um, the scribe's work um, they needed some a scaffolding upon which to build their, their um, textual exposition and that is generally um, kind of the ruling and the pricking and the way that the page is uh, conceived and designed, how the text is arranged on it, but then also mise en page can include paratextual features and in the little um, snippet of a manuscript that you see in the top right of the slide, um, the paratextual features would now include the later annotation and foliation that is provided there, but would focus first of all on what kinds of things are going on around the, the main writing grid that were put in at about the time um, of the manuscript's production. So then this question of the affordances of the page or the opening is what I'm saying, is the sort of so what question. In what way do the scribes and the compilers design their pages um, to encourage particular kinds of responses from readers and users and others who pass through books. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about that in recent years. Um, and I'm, I'm going to only dwell on it in passing because really what I'm going to talk about um, during this presentation is uh, uh, are the tools and the materials and um, what we can make of the sort of history of mise en page, really from the sort of 5th century um, into the 15th. So again, a few things to bear in mind, caveats that all medievalists must consider when they're looking at mise en page is what has subsequently happened to that textual object. Now in the case of this, which is Cambridge University Library FF123, um, which is a, a Psalter um, uh, 11th century, you can tell by looking at the acrobatic M um, of the, of the um, misericordiam uh, three quarters of the way down the folio, you can tell he's lost his foot, it's disappeared. And then if you sweep your eyes up to the top of the folio, you can see how very close to the edge of the um, membrane the red Old English words are. So we can be fairly certain that this manuscript was larger when it was produced and that it's been victim to the trimming that binders um, often put manuscripts through in order to make them fit a kind of prescribed size. So when we're thinking about the way that the page is laid out, we often have to bear in mind that we might have lost parts of the page and therefore some of the evidence. And in the case of this manuscript, if you look very carefully to the left of the leg of the acrobat in the M, you can see half of three or four prick marks right on the very edge um, of the folio. And the pricking would not necessarily be adjacent to the edge um, of margins, as we'll see. So the second thing to bear in mind is imaging. And when we are looking at manuscripts um, on, in, in the digital realm, which is uh, what most of us, or not all of us, have to do at the moment, um, you have to bear in mind what processes those images have been through and what you can and cannot see as a result. 
And oftentimes one might be tempted to um, sample folios and you might just inadvertently sample folios where um, dry point ruling, which is done with a, a kind of hard edged object, um, you may not be able to see the ruling. And so best advice is always to go right the way through the manuscript if you've got the time to do that. And of course, then we have limited access to the manuscripts themselves, even when the repositories are open just by virtue of distance or time um, convenience or the fact that some are not always very friendly to readers. So the final kind of caveat um, um, is really well illustrated by this example here, which is Cambridge University Library II-11, which is an old English copy of the Gospels from Exeter um, around 1060 during the episcopacy of um, Bishop Leofrich. And um, one might be tempted to talk about the ruling on this page as having been done in red crayon um, with a paratextual feature up there in the top um, right of um, MAR 9, which gives us the chapter, the, the um, gospel and the chapter number. But actually this red crayon, um, it was put in in the 16th century by um, Archbishop Matthew Parker, um, who was a collector of manuscripts and who especially um, uh, collected old English manuscripts because he was interested in the origins of the church at the time of the Reformation. And he liked to uh, intervene in his own manuscripts and I suppose provide cues for legibility, um, but also fiddle with the composition of manuscripts. And his collection is at um, Cambridge Corpus Christi College and it's fully digitized in the Parker and the Web website. But we need to be aware of later interventions. So if a manuscript from the 11th century, for example, has what looks like pencil or crayon ruling, it's really unlikely to have originally had that pencil and crayon ruling because on the whole, that was a process or those materials of, of lead and crayon um, tended to only come into um, use prolifically in the 12th century. So bearing all of these caveats in mind, um, what kinds of evidence do we have for pricking and ruling and setting up the frame for the writing? Well, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because um, this, I, this, you know, the whole presentation will be available for your careful perusal later. But um, uh, the tools that, that um, they had obviously were sharp, pointy implements in order to do the pricking in the manuscript that would form the puncture to guide the lines that would be done up until the 12th century in a hard point that is um, through pressure on the page and from the 12th century onwards were generally done using pencil or crayon and then later actual ink. So these tools, they had compasses. Um, there are some who think that there were um, pricking wheels. I'm not so sure about that, but there were compasses. There were these awls, um, A-W-L, that's, so I'm saying all. Um, and the early English words are there rulers, ruling, ruling frames, and then bone folders, which are illustrated, um, kind of, I suppose, antique versions are illustrated on the left of those bone folders for pressing down um, the bifolio, the bifolium um, uh, across which you ruled. And I can illustrate this better than talking about it by showing you a very famous picture from the Hamburg Bible, um, 13th century Bible, where you can see that the ruling itself in the very in the bible um, is done uh, using probably pencil and the image of the monk well he's he's a, a, an evangelist who is um, copying out his manuscript um, is really helpful for showing us the kinds of tools um, that were available to scribes and manuscript compilers in this period and you can see that he's ruling across the bifolium so that's when it's folded it'll be two folios and he's using a long ruler um, to guide from prick to prick what is a uh, uh, described for you there in terms of the actual writing grid, a single column, it'll provide for a single column of text with two pairs of vertical bounding lines and extended horizontal lines, as you can see, the first, second and third line, and then the last two horizontal lines extended across the full width of the folios. And he seems to have left in his, this little image, this representation, wide margins from commentary and for commentary. And we can learn an awful lot from um, medieval uh, depictions of scribes at work, often the evangelists, they were nearly always um, shown or very often shown um, uh, writing out their gospels. And so here we've got uh, Matthew in a John Ryland University Library of Manchester manuscript written in Dinant in uh, uh, Flanders in the middle of the 12th century. We've got Matthew 
and he's ruling a bifolium that is this uh, pair of folios that are obviously conjoined and that will be folded to form two folios or four pages. He's ruling his bifolium with a ruling frame. And I can't see the tool that he's using. Um, you can see his finger kind of holding the ruling frame down. But he has done a, one of the most simple kinds of writing grids uh, is shown to us here. It's a single column that for text with single vertical bounding lines that extend from top to bottom. And then these horizontal lines contained within the writing grid um, for, on folio to folio. And obviously there are narrow margins. And then you have this wide interlinear space. So I can tell you that even though this is a representation of a manuscript, that what he is doing here in this image is getting ready to produce something that is absolutely as straightforwardly legible for a user probably to read out in public. Wide interlinear space, so wide space between the lines, um, a very clean kind of design that isn't too difficult for an, a reader who is competent um, to be able to manage. And in fact, this is the manuscript itself. So this is the very manuscript in which this image occurs. And you can see that is effectively what you get. So I really have spent a lot of time looking at images of scribes um, and artists and pictures where books appear in, in my latest book um, to think about whether these are self-representative in a sense or what they tell us about the production of manuscripts in this period. And um, in this actual book, which is, say, is the middle of the 12th century, and if you look very closely um, at what's on the screen right now, you can see clearly the round pricking down the margins, guiding the horizontal lines from left to right of folio. And you can also see a kind of quite a, a relatively generous interlinear space um, uh, between the rulings so that the writing is really um, very clear and doesn't kind of get tangled up. And uh, additional things that you can see here that are entirely sort of 12th century inventions for being able to retrieve information on the page are, for example, if you look to the top of the folio, you will see spread out in red the words secundum Matthaeum, so according to Matthew. So this is the Gospel of Matthew. And those running headers came into um, use in the 12th century to facilitate ease of reading. And um, obviously we still have those now in, um, in contemporary books. And you will also see that in the left-hand side of the image, so that's the verso, um, initials that correspond, um, initials that are at the beginning of the line um, introducing new portions of the text are offset and, it, and they are offset into a separate kind of little gutter of vertical rules. So the ruling is, is actually more complicated in the manuscript itself than in the representation of Matthew on the left. But nevertheless, you can see that it's this single column format. The 12th century sees a move in some cases from single column format for Latin books to double column format. So we can use mise en page, as I'm already sort of suggesting, um, as a means to date manuscripts. According to some paleographers, codicologists, it's not that easy to use ruling grids or other features of mise en page to localize manuscripts to particular places and in one chapter that i was reading recently the um, author was saying it's not at all possible because there's too much variety and actually i don't believe that that is true i think it's likely now that we're in a position to look at hundreds of thousands of images of manuscripts it's likely that we will find patterns that are actually significant both in terms of date and in terms of localization. So I think there's the potential for a lot of very exciting um, research in the, next, uh, in the next few years. So another image here is um, uh, from the same manuscript and it's St. Mark and he's sharpening his quill with a knife and I just, I like the way that now we're shown the book open, it's a hefty book, it's a weighty book um, and we're shown um, the finished kind of bifolium, if you like, with these, this single column of text represented in the image. And what struck me, because I'm now obsessed with prickings, and what struck me when I was looking at this manuscript very closely, and it's on the right-hand side of the screen, is the fact that the prickings are cross-shaped, which I think is um, quite unusual, and uh, it will send me off to look at other Flanders manuscripts um, from the middle of the 12th century to see if one could say something about the tools that were used to produce the pricking in that way. So a kind of minimal description of what we're looking at here would be something like, oh, hello, there's another picture. So this is actually a really famous um, image of um, 
scribes and compilers producing a manuscript and above it is Christ in majesty with uh, his gospel book. But um, here, what's quite interesting of the guy on the right, the chap on the right, seems to have something that some, some scholars have said is a ruling frame that allows for multiple bifolia, so those openings, multiple bifolia to be ruled um, simultaneously. Uh, he's definitely got a knife in his hand, not a quill. The chap on the left has a quill in his hand. Um, so this is just a, another sort of very interesting image and quite a lot has been written about this one in a, uh, an effort to interpret uh, what these two manuscript producers are doing here. Um, anyway, so a minimal description of what, of what we're talking about would be something um, as in yellow in this actually published description that um, I did years and years and years ago from Corpus Christi College, Cambridge. Uh, 303, which was the manuscript I did my PhD on um, in the medieval period. And the, uh, the yellow lines really are, are describing what you see in a very sort of straightforward um, 12th century manuscript, uh, which is, you know, you describe the ruling as being led, you describe the pricking, you describe the way that the bounding lines um, are, are put into the writing grid, you describe how, how that creates margins um, and describe the number of lines. And I think this is really a sort of minimal kind of mise en page uh, description that um, one should be seeking to achieve with every manuscript that one looks at. And I think that while we have such amazing access to manuscripts through the digital realm, what the digital realm actually encourages us to do is to be a little bit like, um, okay, maybe it's just me, but a little bit like a squirrel. And I'm, I look at something, I think, oh my God, that's really interesting and I intend to look fully at it and to, and to note the manuscript properly. And then I get distracted by it, something else in the manuscript and I end up um, jumping about all over the place. And it, I think it will pay uh, methodologically to be much more systematic in uh, digital work in the way that one tends to be when one actually goes to a library with that limited time to look at a manuscript. Anyway, um, that's another caveat, I suppose. So, um, to get a minimal description like this, you can also represent it visually. And um, there's a scholar, Leslie Weber Jones, who was um, active in the 1930s to the 1960s. He was at CUNY um, in New York. And he has written what I think are probably in, in English, the most fundamental work on pricking and ruling still. And if you read, and um, I put a bibliography on my uh, text technologies website, so I'm very happy to send anyone a bibliography if you want to um, drop me a line, if you don't have access to my, to my blog, you can just email me with any questions at trahan at stanford.edu. Anyway, so Jones, just what a remarkable, remarkable scholar. And um, this was his kind of uh, be all and uh, kind of writing grid. It's, it's, uh, it shows um, the history of pricking and ruling from at least the fourth, fourth century to probably um, the 15th, the single column text, which is just a remarkable condensation of knowledge right there. And he tells us about the um, history of ruling and he talks about, um, you can, and I've done this after his in uh, the publication, Where Are the Prickings? But you can see H to H is this very early intercolumn um, kind of ruling that dies out. And then you've got B, um, B and E and I and L, and those are rulings that come in um, in, from about the um, late 6th century onwards and, and are regarded as um, the insular tradition of ruling. So you can do these kinds of ruling grids um, no matter what material you're looking at. When we're talking about this intercolumn uh, pointing or pu puncturing, um, you can actually see it here in the Vatican Library, LAT 10959, um, Cyprian, uh, letters of Cyprian. It's a fragment, but you can see between the two columns the, the pricking going right down the middle. It's a very early manuscript, fifth century. Um, and so this is what he's talking about when he mentions that. So you can, the, the history of pricking and ruling um, is particularly interesting. He kind of, I think he's uh, still one of the best uh, writers about this. And even though some, some findings will have been corrected, I suspect, but um, this intercolumnar ruling kind of uh, dies out and is replaced by uh, pricking, I mean, by pricking on either side of the column of writing, as we will see in a moment. So the ruling and the pricking are really important for guiding the writing. And by the time we get into the sort of higher Middle Ages, the 12th and 13th centuries, what we tend to see um, are, uh, are really accomplished scribes, not in fact writing on the ruled line, but writing between the ruled lines, kind of, um, um, almost as if the, the writing is floating in air. 
um, it's, uh, fascinating, but not all scribes kind of were able to manage the ruling that their uh, compilers laid down for them. And in this case, it's possibly a decorator rather than just a scribe since this is display script. But if you <laughs> look really closely at this complex um, missile page, you will see uh, that the scribe um, is struggling somewhat to work out quite where they should be placing um, their capitals. And in the next example, which is a Plimpton manuscript, um, you can see that there are two sets of ruling for only one column um, in the right margin there. And they're done at different times, clearly. They're used with different tools being used. So there's a rounded awl on the right-hand side and something more akin to a flat-edged knife on the left-hand side the knife leaving a horizontal slit, the awl leaving this round sort of punctus perforation. And it guides the ruling that is done. It looks, looks like crayon, but I wouldn't know unless I saw the manuscript where the two top horizontal bounding lines extend across the full length, a uh, full width of the folio. And you have later annotation and foliation providing uh, sort of paratextual features. And you have a notar mark, uh, an extended notar mark in the right hand margin saying that somebody finds that bit of text uh, really interesting. And the nota is because the note down at the bottom is nota, uh, nota contra fratres mendicante. So it's a note against the um, friars. And that's what somebody is interested in. So that's when things go slightly awry. And of course, many, many manuscripts um, are not necessarily um, as proficient as others. And most of what I'm going to show you are institutional manuscripts, and I'm actually going to linger a little bit in the 12th century in a moment. And so um, you tend to find pat patterns here rather than uh, idiosyncrasy, uh, as in books that emerge in the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries, which are done much more by individuals um, and increasingly by, uh, by professionals, where the page layout uh, patterns, I think, are um, less easy to discern. So we talked about the history of ruling and on this uh, early folio from an 8th century Vatican manuscript you can see these horizontal slit-like punctuses indicated by the red arrows and they are adjacent to the single column of text and this is an early form of pricking where those prick marks are very close to the text and one sees this again in uh, the Litchfield Gospels for example, so these early manuscripts. Um, and you will see something similar here in uh, the Sangal manuscript. But now um, the prickings have sort of started to move uh, slightly further away from the edge of the text. And that um, really sets things up from the, um, so the eighth and the ninth centuries. By the time we get to the ninth century, you really see this inner, um, this inner and outer pricking, which is an insular form. You will find it in most British um, and Irish manuscripts and also those that were done in British and Irish centres on the continent. And this is a form of pricking and ruling that is common to these manuscripts. And what joins those pricks is this hard point ruling that I was telling you about. And in this 11th century English um, manuscript of homilies and saints' lives, you can see that this is dry point ruling done with a very sharp, with quite a sharpish kind of implement. I mean, it's blunt, but it's, you know, it's, it's got, uh, it's narrow and it can create these channels, these furrows in the vellum. And it's been done not on this side because you can actually see from this image that it's the impression. So the ruling was actually done on the other side of this um, folio. And actually ruling was often done on hair sides uh, of, manuscripts again, particularly um, as we advance into the sort of middle, middle ages, so the 10th and 11th centuries, pricking tended to be done on the hair sides and choirs, that is arrangements of folios, um, uh, kind of altered at this time too. And, and one would look at those arrangements of choirs um, as, a, as a code ecologist, you would look at the way that those choirs were set up and arranged and mise en page and code ecology kind of go together um, very closely indeed. So this dry point ruling, and I just wanted to show you in the same manuscript, as a counterpoint, if you like, to that horizontal slit-like um, puncture or the, um, uh, the cross-shaped puncture that we saw earlier, um, I wanted to show you these ovoid punctures on the right-hand margin of this manuscript. A very generous interlinear space, that is um, to say that this is a manuscript 
I'll just go back to, to more of it. This is a manuscript that is inc would be incredibly easy to pick up and read from, and indeed that is the manuscript's function. So mise en page tells us something about the nature of the manuscript and its functionality. And what is quite interesting about these ovoid punctures too is that they must have been done by, by using a ruler to guide the awl um, because they are so straight. When you see compass, compasses used to um, do the ruling, as Jones tells us, you often get a kind of zigzag effect. And I have, this is seriously my new passion is looking at, um, or one of them, is looking at these prick marks because I think there's probably a lot more to be said about them since we have access to so many manuscripts at our fingertips. So a fairly simple kind of uh, ruling grid uh, would be seen, this is Cambridge Corpus Christi College, Cambridge 303, middle of the 12th century, Rochester, contains homilies and saints' lives written in English in this proto-Gothic hand, but with um, Anglo uh, uh, early English um, characters or letter forms and I've gone over it with the PowerPoint slide um, to show you uh, the kind of the basis of the ruling grid. Um, it was what I described in the yellow writing uh, a few slides ago and this is a simple kind of uh, ruling grid for text that I think as I say is meant to be um, sort of uh, easy to read, very legible, very clear cut and you can see the prick marks on the right hand on the edge of the folio on the right hand side. And if you take away the image, then you end up with the ruling grid. Um, cack handed though that is, it's not brilliant is it? But nevertheless, you get, you get the idea. Um, and here is an image of the triangulated. So it's an awl with a kind of triangulated um, sort of uh, stem uh, on the right hand side of the folio. So we're looking at triangular punctus now, so triangular punctures. And what is interesting about those triangular punctures is that Corpus Christi College Cambridge 303 has never been firmly localised. It's most likely from Rochester. And so I was digging around just a couple of days ago, um, looking at manuscripts that I wrote about 30 years ago and thinking, I wonder what the shape of the punctus is in these, um, in these manuscripts. And lo and behold, the Rochester Bible, which is reasonably securely attributed to Rochester, roughly the same period, middle of the 12th century, 1140. Um, also has, as you can see in the snippet there, um, this triangulated all shape of um, uh, punctures, um, prickings for the ruling. So I will follow up and go through the manuscript much more carefully, but I just, I thought that was very interesting and you never know that it might, in fact, if you can amass enough information, you might be able to detect patterns that would allow you not, not only to um, provide those broad base dates, but also to ascribe manuscripts to particular places um, of localization. So interesting in the um, Rochester Bible too is the uh, uh, ruling uh, between the columns and uh, it's a two column book as opposed to Corpus Christi College Cambridge 303 which is a single column book and you can see the um, prickings at the top of the vertical um, uh, bounding lines. So pricking is not just in the left and right margins, and especially by the time you get into the 11th and 12th centuries, but prickings also occur um, to guide the vertical bounding lines. And in fact, we find them, we do find them earlier too. So 12th century running header there, Lieber, um, or whichever book of the Bible uh, they're going on to describe. So an even simpler um, example is uh, this 14th century manuscript. So it's not that things get more complicated necessarily as we go through the centuries. Um, this isn't a thing about, there's no sort of sense of progress or anything like that necessarily, but in this 14th century manuscript, as you can see, this is surely the simplest ruling grid of all time. Um, there are no um, horizontal lines in, the scribe is immensely competent and I mean, it appears that, that he or she is writing freehand. So that is the complete ruling grid in this uh, Plimpton manuscript as late as the 14th century. And designing ruling grids, and I know there was a discussion on uh, Twitter earlier this week about LaTeX or InDesign or other software programs that might allow us to generate these kinds of ruling grids without having to do them by hand or painstakingly using um, lines in PowerPoint or something like that. Um, I think that's probably a real, that's a desideratum now. That's a, a really important thing for us to try and uh, accomplish if it is, doesn't already exist. In her book, uh, Jennifer Shepherd in the Buildwas books. This is a fantastic book. This is the most complete kind of code ecological and um, uh, paleographical kind of analysis that one can have of a collection of books from Buildwas uh, Cistercian Monastery in Shropshire 
in the 12th, 13th and 14th centuries. And she provides the ruling grids for each manuscript as they change. And she's looking for the makeup of the book from scribe to scribe to scribe, because many times scribes were responsible for pricking their own um, stint. So they would have a number of choirs and they would prick them themselves. And so you do end up with um, this variation in ruling grids. The question then is, you know, what kinds of patterns emerge and what can you say about those patterns as they emerge? So this is the kind of ideal that one would aspire to. And you can certainly see how um, automation would really assist in um, the provision of this kind of uh, visualized uh, kind of framework of the page. So by the 12th century, then we have the emergence of different um, tools to assist in page layout, including crayon, as you see here in this uh, homiletic manuscript at Columbia University, the Plimpton Plimpt 52. Um, you can see the crayon really clearly. You can also see what looks to me like possibly a slightly later uh, incipit Amelia uh, 34 um, uh, running header at the top there and then for a later foliation again um, in the top right hand corner. Um, again things to e uh, ease the reader's burden as they um, find their way through these manuscript books. So crayon ruling and pencil ruling as is very clear I think on this completely kind of if there was a sort of typical 12th century, later 12th century um, Latin book, uh, this kind of book would be that, would be that typical book with, um, you know, beautiful proto-Gothic, clear uh, ruling grid with extended uh, first and second horizontal lines across the folio and uh, anti-penultimate and um, ultimate lines at the bottom of the folio, this two column format with the offset, uh, litera notabilior, um, decorated initial, that initial T, but also um, other kinds of decorative devices on the page in this red rubrics and these other um, colors being used for the incipits to guide the eye as the reader reads. So what does happen as we, as we move through the centuries is more attention to readers and what readers need because there are more readers. So there's a running head, which is contemporary then, it just says Swithin, because this is the life of Saint, I assume it's the life of Saint Swithin. Um, so with a view to the book being read, perhaps by a number of different people. So you have to anticipate a number of different readers and provide something that is as clear as possible. And what, and what we tend to find too, is that the white space on the page draws um, annotators and readers in. So I know that everyone listening to this will be really familiar with um, the idea of sort of marginalia. And this is uh, called, uh, Cambridge University Library II 133. It's got a Christchurch Canterbury and an Ely pair of origins. It's again, it's old English homilies. And um, it's around sort of 1170. Um, it has a variety of different ruling grids, but it has a scribe who is himself really engaged in what he's doing. And he comes back and he adds material, both in French and Latin and English, um, to the margins, expanding the range of the book and taking it out of just the sort of religious homiletic book into something much more akin. There are some uh, proverbs and sort of ro romancy quotations in the volume as well. So margins, you know, they kind of, they pull the reader in, they draw the reader in and they ask for conversation. Mar space, space after all is, is a kind of invitation, right? Space is potential for someone to fill it. And um, that is definitely what's going on in this manuscript. And then it's filled in by design in some of the more complex books that we see in the 12th and 13th centuries. This is the period of scholasticism, of the rise of the universities, of the layout of books that becomes just kind of extraordinary. And this is one of my all time favorite manuscripts, uh, Cambridge Trinity College R17. One is the A. Adwin Assalter, circa 1155, Christchurch, Canterbury. It is a tripartite Psalter. There are three different Psalters, the Gallicanum, the Romanum, and the Hebraicum in this manuscript and each of them is glossed and has a commentary, and there are three languages. So it's multilingual, multi-textual, multimodal, because there are so many images and no pair of openings, no, no pair of openings. So no verso recto as you turn the folios is the same as any other. In other words, every folio is designed beforehand to exactly fit the text. Uh, one by one. It's just extraordinary and hugely complicated. And although there are still lots of white space on the page, perhaps to rest the eyes, on the whole, you are 
um, looking at a really complex ask of any reader. So any reader would really have to be not just competent, but actually a fluent reader, a skilled reader, in order to engage with this um, incredible presentation display volume, which is also um, a scholastic. Uh, it's showing what they knew at Christchurch in this period. Just amazing. Fully digitized on the digital website at Cambridge Trinity College. And then something like this also at uh, Cambridge Trinity College, I have to tell you, their, their digital website is my probably my favourite. It's a very straightforward, easy to use um, digital repository, and it really repays um, the time that you spend in it. Um, so, uh, they're all great, but I particularly like this one. But this is another 12th century manuscript. Um, and again, all these sets of commentaries, and I'm showing you this because again, no single folio is like any other folio. And this is like, what does it look like? It looks like a photograph of Manhattan, um, you know, taken from the air, the kinds of the white spaces being those streets that you walk down, or it's like walking into a building and these are the kinds of alleyways or the, the pathways that you must take through, um, through the text of the building. Um, it's just an sort of incredibly accomplished, remarkable thing not untypical at all of the 12th century and you have all of this sort of paraphernalia going on around the page so again you have these running headers you have um, uh, uh, abbreviated chapter numbers um, in the margin so you can find where you need to be you have um, these beautiful kind of capitulum marks these sort of swirly um, uh, marks to guide you through the text and then um, you often have catchwords and choir, choir um, signatures to help to sort of make sure that the volume is put together in the right way. So this is just, you know, this is an extraordinary thing. And I realise I've, I've got lots of slides. Well, actually, I haven't got that many now, but um, I'm going to quickly whiz through what, what's left. So, you know, the thing about Muse en Page is that it's teamwork. It really is. And, it, you know, maybe, maybe uh, uh, in the simpler books, it's a scribe responsible for his or her own choir. When you move into the um, realm of books um, that are decorated and uh, head towards the sort of more deluxe type of volume, you're talking about teamwork. You're talking about artists, often professional, coming in to finish off initials like you see in this London British Library Royal manuscript here, which again is, is Gospels. Um, and this one is obviously not finished. And that's great because it shows us the, the um, sequence that the book was produced. And it also shows us those um, uh, pencil notes in the top margin and down the side are uh, directions for the artists that might be scraped out with a knife um, when the book has been complete so that they disappear, they're erased, they, they're scraped off. Um, but right now you can see that um, the scribe was supposed to have come and written, um, actually they did write uh, Johannes Evangelista, but it tells you in the margin, top left margin, that it's Johannes the Evangelista that needs to be written. So these instructions do still exist in um, a large number of manuscripts and they're really interesting to follow because they tell us how these things were produced and the order of the um, page layout as it's transmitted into manuscript form. So what's really interesting um, then as we move from the 12th into the sort of 13th century is rather like saying, oh, you know, pencil and crayon started to be used in the 12th century around actually 1125 or something like that. That's a fairly consistent dating uh, mechanism for us. In the 13th century, there's this rather curious shift of um, copying texts, uh, as you can just see on the right hand, the folio that bends over on this image, copying texts above the top line of the ruling, right? So you can see it just there and you can look, go back through the slides. And when we get to around 12, ooh, 30, 1240, something like that, you start to find manuscripts being written uh, uh, underneath the top rule. As you can see, it's clearly the case in this Ancrin Awissa, uh, Cotton Titus D18. Now this manuscript has been dated um, 1300, which is not right, but it's also been dated first half of the 13th century, and it is first half of the 13th century, but I think we can put it firmly in the second quarter um, because of this under top line, as you can see in this slide here. So manuscripts um, that become denser and denser when we move into the sort of uh, 12th, you saw all the information on those folios, 12th century, into the 13th century manuscripts shrink in size, script can shrink in size, and far more information is being put onto the page in order to maximize the capacity of the codex and also to be wary of costs. And you start to see the emergence in the 13th century of these very famous 
um, Bibles. This is actually not a tiny Bible, but um, there are Parisian tiny Bibles where the writing is done with the tiniest of feathers and they're cramming in as much as possible. It's heavily abbreviated. These are texts that are not necessarily for your general competent reader, um, depending on the level of competency, because they are um, so heavily abbreviated and so small, they, they, are, they repay close, close study by um, scholars. And that kind of um, is in contrast to something like this, which is uh, a book of hours, British Library Additional 28681, which is fairly typical of a book of hours in as much as there is a lot of white space. Now you saw a lot of white space here too, but dense um, writing. And here you can see it is a much kind of um, kinder uh, layout, manuscript layout for the reader. And so just a final image in this sequence. Um, again, this is a Tick Hill Psalter at New York Public Library, um, incomplete as you can see, and therefore showing us a complex um, book of hours mise en page with illustrations that were, or illuminations that were not completed, and with line fillers on the right of the, each individual column to make it a very even um, and straightforward type of column design. Um, those line fillers have also not been finished. So, um, there are lots of other things that one could say about non-religious books, about secular books, about books of poetry. You can read Malcolm Parks on that, um, about personal books like um, Digby 86, Digby, Digby 86 or Harley 2253, specialist books, um, where the mise en page is much more sort of idiosyncratic. What I've been looking to show you is something about the patterns and the way that um, we can discern patterns. And so just to finish with artificial intelligence, uh, just one minute on this, um, Stanford Global Currents, um, which is a project that Ben Albritton, Mark Algy Hewitt and I did, um, was feature extraction using machine learning with Mohammed Sheriat up in um, Montreal at the ETS there. And we were able to take elements of the page, so uh, in large capitals, um, litera notabiliores, intertextual space, and other features of the page, send PDFs of training data to the lab, and they designed algorithms that extracted um, litera notabiliores, so those very large um, decorated initials, in large capitals, which are the ones that you find in the body of the text, rubrics and intertextual space. And we had returned to us a massive, well, it's not that massive, is it, in this great scheme of things, but it's pretty big, uh, 14 and a half thousand litera notabiliores, you can read that, quarter of a million, um, extractions of intertextual space and from that we know that the that, uh, machine learning can be used for all kinds of mise en page feature extraction visual um, color saliency um, analysis and other kinds of really apparently easy to do set things like this which are overlays and the overlay on the left is of where you find plain capitals in hundreds of thousands of manuscript folios and on the right where you find litera notabiliores. I don't think it's a hugely su surprising. These are both rectos um, of different, of you know, this uh, assemblage of manuscripts. It's not really surprising that you would on the right hand side not find litera notabiliores on the right of a recto folio. Um, and so one might imagine when you do that would be interesting commenting on and you can go behind these density maps to find out more about um, what creates patterns like these. And it's patterns, I think, um, that we can be really interested in finding out more about. Uh, you can uh, have access to our image galleries. And in fact, we have a website, Stanford Global Currents. Um, and now I have to just run through into intertextual space and a variety of other things from the training data and to the end, to the takeaways, things that I hope um, this has been useful in uh, helping you think through not just the ways that mise en page can help us date, but possibly that patterns that could be discerned could be used more proficiently to provide additional information um, about uh, localization. And that variations in mise en page cater for different kinds of readers and have different kinds of functionalities. And often you can look at a manuscript and instantly kind of know the potential functionality of that book in the real world. Um, and I think what we can do now with the digital uh, realm in terms of artificial intelligence and other kinds of machine learning tools and methods um, will change the shape of manuscript studies 
building on the work of people like Jones and E.A. Lowe, Alex Rumble and others whose, uh, whose scholarship has been so fundamental. The end, sorry, ran over a bit, but pictures are nice. Okay, that's me done. Oh, what have I got to do now? I've forgotten. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I think we can both share our videos, Elaine. I'm just gonna stop sharing. Here's me, hi okay. everyone. Oh, I can't stop my video. Oh. We've got that issue again, that host. Thing. Hold on just a second. Hopefully this will work now. Yeah, that's me. Hello. Hi. Hi. So we have 15 questions in the Q&A. Thank you all for upvoting um, and letting us know which were most interesting to you. So I'll start with um, Elizabeth Manis's question and then I'll sort of tack on to that a number of questions that have come up about tools. Mm -hmm. um, so from Elizabeth Manis, were there any guild rules governing the types, qualities and other types of criteria of instruments used for pricking? So I suppose by the time we get into the later medieval period, so when you've got the Scriveners um, and other guildsmen, and uh, what's, what's quite interesting is the relationship between the Scriveners and the sort of leather workers, um, there may very well be stipulations, but for the earlier period, so everything sort of, well, as far as I know, um, pre sort of 1300, um, there's hardly anything written about this uh, mechanical process. I think so, um, Jones in his articles, uh, Where Are the Prickings? And um, there's a number of other articles and they're on my bibliography. Um, he comments on the paucity of uh, contemporary comment on the production of manuscripts. And it's maybe, well, was that thing I put it up at the end, that composition book, you know, these things quickly become just sort of a kind of quotidian um, obviousness. And we tend not to comment on things that are quotidian obviousnesses. And I think that um, that is why um, even somebody like Cassiodorus or um, in the Didascalican or any of those kinds of works where we tend to go to look for comments about the production of manuscripts or the materiality of manuscripts, um, there's very little about tools. But I suspect the later one goes, um, the more likelihood there is. And again, I think a relationship between leather workers and their tools, and I get this from looking at the uh, Middle English Dictionary, and um, uh, Scrivener's is a good place to start. So um, I will help our questioner out and have a look um, after this session. Another question about tools is um, from Sarah Charles. Could you say a bit more about why you do not think there is evidence for wheels for pinpricking? Yeah, no, not really. I think it's a, such a debate. I mean, it's a debate that's been had, you know, in print um, for the last at least sort of 50 years. Um, the only thing I can say is, is um, that a wheel, and so one needs to do like immense amounts of detailed work and perhaps Sarah's asking this because she's done it. And if so, do say, that's fantastic. Um, on not the, necessarily the shape of the prickings, but the pattern as they make their way down the edge of the folio, because a wheel, you should be able to identify sort of every eighth prick should be a particular shape, right? So you ought to be able to detect patterns if there are, if a wheel is being used. And um, I'm not aware of any manuscripts where one could say definitively a wheel was used because you can discern that. Whereas you can say a ruler was used and you can say it's likely a compass was used. Um, the one, actually there was an example yesterday that I was looking at, which was quite interesting, where it was a verso and obviously the ruling down the side, um, away from the margin, so probably 12th century. And it was straight, straight, straight. And then it suddenly veered off to the left. And that was curious. Well, maybe that, that's about as wheel-like as I've come across, but I can't really say much more about it. And there are lots of articles um, that say there was no such thing and lots of articles that say um, don't rule it out. So one last question, I believe this is the last question about 
Oh no, there's a couple of other questions about tools. So I'm going to keep up, keep on with that. Um, you mentioned cross shape prickings mm -hmm. earlier. Do you think that these were deliberate double strokes or possibly a cross headed instrument? Well, my initial response to it, because I was so surprised. So this was in the, um, oh gosh, I can't remember now. It's in the, obviously in the PowerPoint. My initial response, so I shouted to my husband, who's born patiently with me as I shouted out things about prickings to him. I said, it's like a Phillips screwdriver. Um, <laughs> my initial response would be, it's so regular in that manuscript. If you look at it again and then go and look at the manuscript, it's so regular that it, that it, that it doesn't appear to me to be two moves of the hand where one would expect you know, some uh, less patterned, less, less consistency. It's so consistent, it suggests to me a cross-headed awl, which is interesting. And there's definitely round awls, there's definitely obviously the knife doing the, the slits. And then there look, there's what looks like a triangular headed awl. Um, but I, I, I don't know what evidence there is for the different screwdriver type of shapes of awls. Um, and that's something I would be interested in following up too. Um, well, the last question came from Katrin Haberfield and she asked a follow up and also related to tools. What material or tool would scribe use to erase crayon or pencil rulings? Well, so, I mean, I, I imagine that they would erase with their knife as they erased errors or um, those pencil annotations, uh, directions for artists or rubricators. So I would imagine they would just erase because, you know, you can do it ever so lightly and it's barely discernible. Um, I don't think they had, no, they didn't have rubbers, did they? they didn't have erasers. I don't think they had erasers. So I think it was always with a knife, at least in, my, in the period that I work in, which is anything up to about sort of 13, 30. Um, this is a question from Carson Kupke. Was ruling used on the centrally pricked pages in addition to the prickings? Or did the pricking those prickings themselves guide the eye of the scribe when copying the columns on either side? So the prickings would be used to guide the ruling. Um, but I think really proficient scribes, really um, experienced scribes, uh, as I suggested in relation to floating writing, used rulings or prickings simply as a kind of visual cue and didn't, and were not rigorously adhering to what was laid down on the page. And the really proficient scribes, you, would, you, you have to go zoom right in to see that. Of course, we're able to do that now in ways that are quite unrealistic when you think about it, but nevertheless provide that kind of a level of information. So I think they would have ruling, but they were able to negotiate um, page layout without um, obtrusive uh, writing grids. And um, this is a clarifying question from Elizabeth Manin, Manis, excuse me. Was prick or pricking the terminology used by the manuscript makers in the 11th and 12th centuries? So in the Middle English Dictionary, they do talk about prickings. Um, and it's an old English word, prick, prickian, it's an old English word. So I think when they talked about somebody who pricked as a pricker, <laughs> so, um, that's, I think it would be pricking. I don't think it matters, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now we're going to get into some questions about the type of text and or genre. Um, mm. From Chantal Cobel, can the genre or type of text dictate the mise en page? Totally. I think that's okay. That's a great question. Um, it's such a good question. That's really worth stressing that the nature of the book's mise en page. I think would generally tend to be dictated by the genre of text. So homiliaries, and we saw a few examples, especially in English, of sermons, um, especially Exeter sermons, that those, the first couple of English examples I, 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 written in English, um, Exeter sermons, um, there's a whole suite of books that were produced roughly around the same time, all following a similar mise en page, a remarkable ability for, um, of, uh, to, to be able to localize those manuscripts with very wide interlinear space, single columns, wide margins that were not really annotated, a clean um, and in fact pristine looking manuscripts that were taken out possibly into the field or used by many readers to produce sermons for delivery. 
Um, and I would argue, and in fact have argued, that some of those manuscripts were themselves used for oral delivery when you must have, as you know, a not too abbreviated text that is clear for the eye. Whereas those scholastic texts where someone digs deep into the text, they can have much more complex page layouts and individuals' manuscripts, students' manuscripts, can be what we would regard as sort of messy and scruffy, like one's own notebook, right? Because only you want to read it. So yes, absolutely. And thank you for that question. It's a very important thing to stress. And sort of as a follow up to that, are you familiar with the musical Rastrum, which drew four or five lines across a page to create the musical staff? Do you want to add any comments on how that relates to mise en page? Um, so music, uh, music mise en page is a thing in its, its, its own whole subject. And I'm familiar with um, that idea of the rastrum, but also of what you can extrapolate from that question more broadly, um, stencils. So stencils were definitely used in some manuscripts to provide, um, you know, uh, regulated mise en page, folio after folio after folio. And in fact, those, rule, those writing frames, maybe in that uh, Trois manuscript, those writing frames were meant to enable you to prick simultaneously through numbers of folios um, and rule simultaneously through numbers of folios. But when you get to pencil ruling, of course you have to rule every folio because you can't, it doesn't score in the way that dry point does. So am I familiar with it? Yes, it's a whole other subject. Mm. Um, since it is 3.03 and we still have quite a number of excellent questions, what I'm going to do is just transition us, I think, online. Elaine had suggested that she could answer some additional questions on Twitter and that you could use the hashtag, what was it? Uh, BSA layout. BSA but layout. My handle on Twitter is at etrahan, but also you can email me. You can just email me and I will answer your question. And I, if you don't mind, I'll take it onto Twitter because there are lots of people um, who are interested in this, many of whom won't actually be present right now because they're doing something else more interesting. But um, uh, yeah, so I'm happy to take questions in any format. And I'll just ask one question I think is a good one to transition us online because you'd shared that bibliography on your website this morning. Erica Loic asks, do you recommend any books slash resources for basic mise en page vocabulary, such as bounding lines, linear space? Um, that is a, an excellent question too. You will find that the majority of textbooks from Bischoff Latin Palaeography to Clemens and Graham to the Cambridge History of the Book will give two to three pages on mise en page. They do provide the basic terminology, but not all terminology is standard. In fact, no polygraphical terminology, hardly any is standard. So that's a caveat there. Um, the fact that they only, you know, that two to three pages, it is not a subject that, has, that I think has, has got the scholarly attention that it, that it merits. And um, so, you know, you can certainly find the terminology in those books, but I think in years to come, uh, new books that are coming out will pay more attention to it. Well, thank you so much. You're very uh, welcome. This made my afternoon. I've really enjoyed participating. And we will end the session now and move on to Twitter. So thank you, Elaine, and thanks everyone for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.